The whole reason the Mantis name is what it is is because the first S chassis control arm looked like the arm of a praying mantis. That's no the only way. reason. That's the only reason it's called that. I designed a gas pedal on Friday last week. That'll be done like probably Wednesday. Like my guys just know what to do. Like when when a driver wins, they got like lasers circling them. Everyone's going crazy. It's all French, and I don't know what anyone's saying, which is cool. <laughs> awesome. You only know that you won because you're being circled by a bunch of green lasers, <laughs> and you might hear your name pronounced completely wrong but you just kind of like just go with it welcome back to the number one drift podcast on youtube presented by injuku racing my name is dawson and we have today a long-awaited podcast josiah fillets from fdf race shop hell yeah appreciate you coming all yeah. the way down this happy awesome. to be here uh i don't know can you talk about some of the stuff that you're down here for because yeah. I have that in. Yeah, in totally. The, okay. All right. Yeah. So we'll, we'll get into that. First, of course, look below the video. Make sure that subscribe button is not still red. Go ahead and click that if it is and hit the bell notification while you're at it so you never miss an episode. Don't forget until the end of March, I am actually giving away a pair of bums glasses each week. Literally, all you got to do is comment and like the video uh, and grab the merch as well. If you haven't already, that's actually all I got for the intro. So if you want to kind of give a rundown on who you are, I know most people probably will know, uh, but in case they don't. Yeah, in case you guys don't know, my name is Josiah Fillets. I own FDF Race Shop. I am a professional driver in, in multiple different scenes. Um, we're doing some big things this year, but uh, in addition to that, I have a podcast of my own. Um, I'm a father to two kids. I have a lot of things going on that keeps me very busy and uh, I own a couple businesses and yeah, it's just a, it's a never ending. The only reason I'm here in the U.S. is for some really interesting endeavors that I'm, you know, I, I never stop going. So that's, yeah. that's kind of like what I, what I do. Hell and yeah. Uh, yeah, that's, that's it. I okay. thought I'd stop here, see you, which was not really on route, but a little detour is, is worth it. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. Yeah, of it's, course. Uh, epic that you finally, we finally got to make this one work. It's been a couple of years. A year yeah. or so now. Since you started, since you, you kind of blew up on Instagram and it was like, uh, I it seemed like you came out of nowhere, which was really interesting because it, all of a sudden you had 50,000 followers on Instagram and I don't know when you had zero, but it didn't seem <laughs> like it was very long before that. And then uh, I think we, I, I think we hit. 10,000 within the first month or something. Yeah, there was a point where our accounts were the exact same. Yeah. And and uh, it was almost a, a subconscious race that I was <laughs> participating in, like right. by accident. I was like, oh man, they got another reel that popped off. I got to, I got to, which friendly competition, <laughs> but I was like, oh, I got to put my my brain to, to the screen and see what I can come up with yeah. <laughs> to compete, which is great. Um, competition breeds innovation so like i was happy to see you guys growing and then there was some interactive stuff i didn't know if you knew about fdf or anything but then i, I saw it mentioned a few times on just like unsolicited mm -hmm. it came up in conversation yeah i thought that was cool. hard not to truthfully <laughs> well you did those car reviews and then i saw like uh vasily russian vasily with yeah. his uh his his porsche cayenne yeah. that uh, had an ls oh, wow. swap in it and we did all the custom suspension on that. So obviously at drift events, the thing did hundreds of laps, like yeah. hundred lap after lap after lap and taking people Didn't for a ride. Didn't see many issues at all. Never. Like, and he's selling it right now. And he's like, I've got like a thousand laps <laughs> all over the country. We're talking the Hoonigan Burnyard, yeah. Orlando Speed World, all over the place in Canada, nonstop, four to five people with music just blasting the whole time. Like it's, uh, <laughs> it was quite That's the rig. Crazy, it was a supercharged dude. LS2 with a, I believe a BMW transmission um, and that was it. And he did like all the fab work to adapt yeah. the drive line to that car. Yeah, it's cool dude, very cool dude. I see him like once a week. Hell yeah. yeah. So he's local to you then? Like very He's local. two hours away, yeah. Oh, okay. He's in yeah. construction, he works hard. He's uh, a super interesting guy if you talk to him outside of this stuff, but he's building um, his A4 into like a pro car. So okay. he's got a dog box in it, he's got a quick change and Again, I made the quick change mount, scanned the subframe, made the rear suspension because they don't really work. Yeah, they rely on a lot of compliance bearing, bushing type type suspension, where the bushing is so big, it's designed to actually deflect under compression. So when you change mm -hmm. that to a bearing, the suspension doesn't move at all. It depends <laughs> on that compliance. And then the front suspension was actually the only thing that was decent with those cars. Wow. But uh, it's it's a it's a VR. 
Porsches yeah. are a whole different, or Porsches are a whole different world yeah. to me. I don't understand. Yeah. He uh, put a VR6 in it. So engineering. Uh, inline six makes 630 wheel or something. Damn. And I drove it and set it up and it, it works really well. Like at the time when we were both testing, my Corvette was fresh. Yeah. And his car <laughs> was fresh. And I came back. I'm like, dude, your car handles better than my Corvette. <laughs> but uh, I hadn't done much with the Corvette. The Corvette was like so unique in every way everything was changed his car was like pretty much stock stuff just yeah. modified a little bit mostly bolt on yeah anyways i didn't expect to talk about him but he's a cool guy and you mentioned oh, yeah. him and that's kind of how you uh mentioned fdf first i think that was the first time i heard you guys talk about it yeah um just to bring it back to our main point but yeah it was cool to see how fast you grew well i appreciate that yeah at the at the time i i was always wanting an fdf kit just the the first revision of it with the two double arms for the compression arm, the lower, yeah. um, my front end was already tweaked. And I had just watched a buddy go through putting that kit on that had basically the same exact wreck as me. And he, he had so many issues with trying to get that kit on because his front end was tweaked and misaligned. The subframe and the stud dimension kind of really depends on yeah. that fitting. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, a subframe replacement, or if the frame rail or tower was bent, it's going to throw off a couple things for sure. Mm. And typically, the rear stud. It depends. Some guys are running those cars without like a proper crossmember brace, yeah. and it'll just either rip the stud right out or bend that stud over. Mm. Um, the stud that goes on the and it rusts out too. Part of my threads yeah. on the the main stud is rusted out. Yeah. Yeah. So we've actually replaced some studs not due to anything other than just fatigue and rust uh we've had to I'm sure you deal with a lot of it up there well the the compression arm the factory one will get seized on so you either have yeah. to cut it off or hammer it off and in that oh, process i spent three days trying to get in, you had it to get seized my on factory there? one off yeah i had to torch the bushing out so that i could get the arm off and then i had to use um a pipe wrench and a yeah. torch just sitting there with it slowly yeah. twisting it back and forth yeah the aluminum oxidizes and the rust of the stud corrodes and it makes a bond that's like stronger than a weld honestly yeah and you can like i had that's to cut nuts. through it on mine i had to cut through it with a sawzall and all sorts of different types of tools to get the main section of the compression arm off get the bushing off and then yeah. you're left with a sleeve and then you kind of like try to slice the sleeve and spread it apart and yep. it's a multi-hour process for sure a northern 350 will have that almost. yeah i'm sure plenty of you guys out there have dealt with that as well yeah um, yeah all right well we'll jump off all of that uh i know you've covered a lot in your own content on how you started fdf but if you want to give like a short version of what sure. the reasoning for starting the company was yeah um basically i uh, came out of school for engineering and it was a problem solving company essentially i spent my time designing uh, solutions for people that had really basic problems um, while I had a full-time job. So mm. basically in the evenings and on weekends, I would uh, make front cross member supports, re replacement kits for S chassis because they would rust out yeah. um, where the uh, tension rod brackets would bolt into the front rad support would rust out. Okay. So I made this like tube kit where it's just a couple plates with some holes, a tube that fit between the frame rails and you cut it out and you weld this one in. Yeah. Um, that was like randomly, a bunch of people were buying it. The margins were good on it. It was a solution. How did people find out about it? Just Instagram. Like uh, I was really big on doing cages and stuff first. So that was how everyone started to find out okay. about what I was doing. And roll cages, um, higher end roll cages, TIG welded roll cages. I got my FIA welding certificate from doing cages for Europe and for like Africa and different rallies. Oh, so I had to weld like uh, specialized materials um, okay. and you had to pass certain tests in order to meet their criteria. So I was making most of my money building rally cages because um, you can charge eight to 10 grand for, for doing one <laughs> that meets these oh, specifications. Um, and that's like the car comes to you fully stripped. Yeah, uh, You spend a week on it or a week and a half. It usually took like 60 to 70 hours and then you ship it back and then they tell their friends on where to get it because I had to redo a couple cages for some guys and they really had a hard time finding um, good fabricators that understand yeah. the build process of a roll cage, which is very complicated when you do it yourself. The, mm -hmm. the order of operations is what most guys skip. You think that you can put the main hoop in and like weld it. Yeah. You're not 
you're not realizing that you need to drop it at some point to get the tops and then you need to compress the sides in to get the outsides of the door bars and people don't think about that. So huh. I found these cages had a lot of missed welds, a lot of bad fabrication, yeah. bad practice. And uh, that's what I was known for was doing it. it. Yeah, properly. So from there, um, I, I used um, compute like CAD. I used computer aided design a lot in making the base plates for those cages because it would yeah. make, if I ever got that car again, it would cut the time in half having this pre-saved. So this was kind of like the evolution of uh, making a repeatable process, which mm -hmm. a lot of guys will save the two hours that it took to draw those parts and they'll just make it custom one-off. But yep. then you have to do a custom one-off every time yeah, you every do it. Every single time. And scaling a business doesn't, uh, it doesn't work when you have to work one hour for one dollar paid, not a dollar, but yeah, yeah. Your time is based on your on the effort put in during that time versus designing a product is the times put in once and mm -hmm. then you reap the benefits for years after. Like there are products. I relate that, that to all my presets and stuff I make for editing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it makes things so much smoother. Absolutely, it's painful up front, but then the, yeah. the, the just the very next time you get to use it, you're super happy that you put that time in. Yep. Um, and then I've done that, you know, 4,000 plus times with all the products. We don't have 4,000 products. I've designed more than 4,000 parts to make Jesus. up the 450 products that, that make up the website um, today. Because some of these kits have 60 to 80 parts mm -hmm. within it. Um, but yeah, basically God, that's, that's nuts to think about. The, the, yeah, the company was a problem solving company. And when I started drifting after building cages and stuff, yeah. I uh, was just getting more angle for myself and, and I didn't really care to do it for anybody else. I, I didn't think the market was, uh, was doable and this is going yeah. back like seven years, eight years. So in doing so, people would ask like, how did you obtain this amount of angle on that car? Like, what did you do? Mm -hmm. And that was modded knuckles. So then I um, started modifying knuckles as like the entry to starting with like drift suspension yeah for like mainly um, s chassis and mainly s chassis just... extending control arms modifying knuckles like gotcha. so i've done hundreds hundreds of those <laughs> i still have the jigs at the shop for modifying knuckles and then i uh, introduced modified knuckles with like a water jet cut roll center correction bracket oh so i would cut the knuckle really in this really unique pattern that would fit my uh roll center correction piece mm -hmm. and then it would locate all the other points to improve roll center um, it would change the trail the mechanical trail of the knuckle and then it would improve your ratio and this was still a modified knuckle so this was like yeah. probably the most advanced modified knuckle that you could buy at the time so okay so what were you noticing in the i guess the way the car was acting to make to want to make those changes yeah so once you lower the car there was some problems with uh, bump steer and roll center so obviously i wanted to correct those uh, when you lower the car too much like this doesn't actually translate into actual mm -hmm. like you, you can't measure anything by just looking at something but you notice the control arms are supposed to be parallel slightly down yeah but uh, when you lower a car you'll notice that the arms are pointing up this affects your bump steer your roll center you don't have great stability up front anymore especially if you remove the sway bar you, your car would just roll like crazy so correcting these things, because back in the day, it, it, your sway bar would simply just hit the yeah, wheel. Yeah. So you would likely just remove it. This is before we had sway bar blade, gotcha. blade kits and stuff. So you'd remove it, but then you have this awful roll center. So now how do I correct that? Well, I need to drop the pivot point on the knuckle. Um, roughly two inches or 50 <laughs> mil was like the standard. So like you would do that and then you would feel the difference in performance on the car. It's handling a lot better up front. So instead of compensating by just like increasing your spring rate a bunch yeah. and maintaining this bad geometry, it's better if you can stay with the 8K, 9K spring and correct the roll center because then you still have your bump control yeah. while uh, having the benefits of proper roll center. So like all this stuff was just early That's on insane. corrections based on, you know, basic geometry and racing dynamics and stuff like that. Like it was just applying yeah. little things that weren't really implemented at the time, especially modified stuff. Like you could get these knuckles for like 400 bucks okay. if you sent me your core. Yeah, yeah. So it was relatively cheap for what you were able to get. And then uh, perfecting the Ackerman curve and, and stuff. What year was this again, roughly? Uh, 
This would have been 2015. Okay. Yeah. So it's not like horribly long ago, but no, the market no. wasn't quite anywhere near there. It was, like there was no other kits on the market that was focusing on stuff that um, incremental, I guess. Well, I just didn't know anything. Like I wasn't yeah. in the drifting world. So I was just going to my local track and solving problems for myself. People were yeah. reaching out to me. I then post about it on Instagram because I thought it was cool how I solved this problem. And then people were like, I have that problem too. And then they, how much? <laughs> and then I started a uh, big cartel website. That was the first website I started, which was Damn, like, I, I remember those. <laughs> like $9 a month. Uh, PayPal, you just start a PayPal account, you link it to your big cartel. It was FDFFab at bigcartel.com or something. Um, and I was selling like hood vents and knuckles and, and basic modified knuckles extended control arms mm -hmm. i sold the pieces that you could weld in yourself to nice. extend the control arms like probably similar to uh what's the company called villains i think they make yeah yeah so like at the time like i was probably pretty similar to them like they were i wasn't okay. doing what they like they were doing rx7 ball joint extensions and stuff like that like they had a little bit of a different market but it was pretty similar to what they were doing Gotcha. Yeah, I think they even had a big cartel website at the time. <laughs> That's yeah. so funny, dude. Uh, Before Shopify was a thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Shopify is expensive, but also, you know, it, it can be, it's, it's worth it. For yeah, sure. I used, that's what, how I started when I first had a website. But, um, okay, so whenever you were growing up, I always, because you have a good entrepreneurial mindset and stuff with the way you run your business and everything else. So, I always feel like all of those types of people have some moment in their life that has kind of correlated to that mindset. Mm -hmm. What was it for you growing up that kind of sh shifted you into that lifestyle? Um, I just couldn't, I couldn't uh, work for anybody. It was difficult for me to see what benefits they were got, what they benefits they were gaining from uh, having employees and having the employees do this amount of work and then what that generates per hour for them versus what they pay. So it was always difficult for me to be like, I just made this crazy thing. Cause I worked in manufacturing for a while, um, yeah. millwright stuff, welding installations, stainless steel, um, like, uh, installations for countertops and sanitary things for like plants, mm -hmm. like Kellogg's and P and G, like I was into all that stuff. And I'm like, I saw the bill on one of these things and it was like $110,000. I spent like three weeks on it. And I'm like, they gave me like three grand <laughs> and they made oh like 110,000 on this. And I'm like, I can see that they're charging two, 250 an hour on, on me yeah. plus times three. Cause there's three of us. So they're making like 750 to a thousand an hour making this thing. We're getting three grand a piece and they're taking 110 off the top minus uh, material Nuts. costs. So being in that uh, environment when I was young and then asking for a raise because at like 19 years old, I could use CAD. I could, I could calculate the bends that, that mm -hmm. we needed to go from like a, a square to a round hopper. They always, these guys always spent so long on it. And I'm like, I can do this on the computer in like 20 minutes. <laughs> and then let me show uh, you how to do your job. <laughs> they just wouldn't pay very much. Um, and they didn't value what I was in school for and what mm -hmm. I could do. So then I, fortunately enough i have to i have to give them some credit they allowed me to actually work in the shop at night as well oh that's cool. so I, I was building trailers utility trailers at like 18 years old and selling those in my parents front yard um and they would take Dude. me like 40 hours and i would make like i don't know eight to nine hundred dollars off these things real simple like wow four by eight and five by ten trailers um, what a side hustle that young yeah that's crazy yeah so that was like, I don't know, I just couldn't help myself. And then yeah. growing up as a kid, I was obsessed with Lego and I would never use the map. I would buy the Lego set only to gain the parts that I saw in the inventory of the box. So no way. If they had like little hydraulic cylinders, I'm like, I'm going to buy this kit so that I get this part so that I can make this thing that I have been thinking of making. Yeah. And at the time, there was no Amazon with Lego pieces. Like you get them off eBay, but... I was too young and like buying stuff online was nowhere near as, yeah. as simple. Like your parents would have to put their credit card in and they're skeptical <laughs> and all this other stuff. So I would buy these kits for universal joints and like uh, pneumatic cylinders and electric motors and I would just make wow. stuff. So I made like pneumatic engines that ran with like a camshaft that 
dude like what flipped. yeah i it was a long time ago and then i couldn't get the motor to stay running so then i put like lego tires stacked as a inertia like a flywheel to keep it like going dude, that's so cool and it was just non-stop like i just would not stop making stuff and yeah. my parents just kept they did their best to just enable it um to just try and keep like that's you know good. this guy's this kid i was playing with lego but like advanced lego until i was like 16 18 years old the technique oh my stuff God. but to this day i feel like you could probably make like an actual functioning machine that would produce a product with Lego. Like I, I always thought I could do that. I mean, you see it. You can do You've it. I've seen people do it on the internet. I that shit pops up on my face. Like if you wanted to like fold that. clothes, for example, you could probably make a Lego machine that did it. One of those for sure. <laughs> and it would do it for you. And it would cost you probably a thousand bucks in like pretty high quality material. Wow. But and they have like programmable like computers and uh, PLCs that you can program the io and and control stuff like they have that now so and it's for kids so <laughs> it's pretty cool we didn't Legos have that are making engineers now yeah like they they took what i was doing and just like quadrupled it with what kids have access to now yeah. with lego just growing in technology and techniques but that was kind of just like nobody said or suggested that i should do that it was just like kind of what i was obsessed with doing yeah like and then i i was play. Uh, this is not part of like the business but i <laughs> yeah, played a lot good. of sports and i just i thought i was gonna go somewhere with that so i don't know i was kind of all over the place that's very similar to what i was i i just didn't like the fact of having a boss mm -hmm. it, that was one big issue for me because like i would do the job but like having the boss tell me specifically how to do the job in this exact manner but this yeah. is more efficient for me so like yeah a good there's a boss. lot of those yeah if yeah. you have a good boss it's definitely doable and and we definitely try to like i have 17 employees now we're going on 18 very soon and that's coming from zero five years ago yeah um i'm here with kyle my mechanic and like you just make it uh an enjoyable place to be and a place where the employees don't actually want to leave when work's over yeah so oftentimes yeah. everyone's kind of still there just or hanging, hanging around, around yeah yeah yeah. That's a good feeling as a business owner, I'm sure. Yeah, for sure. And we try to give ins incentives for them to to work on. Like we give uh, a cut to my uh, YouTube content creator, Jack. Mm -hmm. He uh, like we, we try to give him an incentive because we wouldn't have it without him. Yeah. So taking care of him is really important and everybody else. Like there, there's always a little thing for everyone um, to take pride in. Like they, they are open to produce whatever mm -hmm. they would like outside of work and they can definitely show off what they're doing within work on their own pages. Yeah, yeah. And the same way that I built my own account, they can they can do whatever they want. Nice. Well, that's yeah. good. Um, I did notice in a video you you published one time on YouTube how you said you with the schooling that you got, it doesn't like necessarily relate to race car parts. Yeah, not so, at all. Like explain that, but also relate it to hiring people too. Because how do you find good enough people that can be a part of that process? Yeah, I that's guess. a good question. Um, yeah, manufacturing engineering is what I went to school for. So that is not related to, it's got a lot of mechanical, but it's mostly to do with production lines like P&G yeah, and Kellogg's. Yeah, big assembly and stuff. The, like these companies that I worked for only because locally to us, there's massive plants in the industrial park. Mm -hmm. And like, this is where Nestle produces their uh, chocolate milk. This is where no, gotcha. Kellogg's okay. produces their cereal. This is where P&G produces all feminine products and adult diapers. That is in <laughs> my city. And it's a huge place. Like Flex. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's massive. And and the materials and stuff that they use is atrocious. I'm I'm shocked that I don't know if I can say that or not, but <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, it's pretty surprising how damaging the chemicals that are used destroys equipment and machines. And you're like, if this chemical is wrecking this machine this fast, and we're using like three one six stainless and high grade aluminum, and it's just yeah. like eating through this stuff, and we're like, this can't be good for your body. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> no this way. Is, it's the perfumes and it's the scents that they throw on these like these feminine products. That's really bad for oh. for the body that yeah like I th it's a big thing now to get like unscented things and stuff like that oh yeah but that stuff would just like eat through it's obviously co in concentrate but man it's lethal lethal stuff I don't yeah know there's some stuff i know people that like the most 
odd names of ingredients that go into some of the crazy beauty products and you know shampoos and stuff yeah and so they, that in yeah. terms of of hiring which is your second question kind of um basically we have a company that offers the fun factor and when i'm hiring for a said position like cnc operator mm -hmm. they look at that as a pretty decent job as is but then they see it as oh i get to build race car products yeah okay. with this with this skill so There's an extra wow factor to it yeah i've never had an issue hiring like people really? people have moved from long distances to work at the shop and uh kyle being one of them and and a few guys definitely um moving long distances some of them commute oh, quite far mm. to work here and they love it so um, we try to accommodate as best as possible for them help them find a place to to, to live basically because we know the area yeah. they don't so if we can find somewhere to to rent or, or help them out there like we do that um, because we definitely we interview a lot of people and then we pick who we feel has a passion for the same thing like if you don't have a passion for cars we don't really want you to work yeah. here because you're just going to see it as a job and we don't see it as a job um, so yeah, like hiring, firing, HR is definitely one of the hardest things about owning a company. Yeah. I would say it's 50% of like your stress and, yeah. <laughs> and anxiety. There's always a problem with something. You're and, always playing damage control. Yeah. Yeah. You are. You're always on the lookout for, and you're, and you're kind of conscious and you're always like kind of walking on eggshells. You don't want to say something wrong, but it's super loose in my shop and everyone's really happy with each other. So it's not that bad but yeah. i can imagine how bad it could be if it was like a job that no one liked <laughs> it would be really <laughs> yeah bad. but uh, luckily everyone takes a lot of pride in what they do so like the weld quality the machining the water jet That's operating good. kyle works on the pro cars like uh the s14 the corvette like it's fun it's cool and he gets the good play character role. on camera too yeah, he's great yeah he's very uh he's very natural he's very funny like in his own way and a lot of people like him like yeah. a lot of people come up to him and they're like oh you're so funny on the channel <laughs> that's awesome like, i think it's great to have uh kind of everyone in the shop developed as a character yeah um, i think that's important for content yeah it, it can't just be me like i, I yeah. jack's probably so sick of me already i <laughs> i come in and he's editing a video where i talked for like 30 minutes and i'm like man you must be so sick of my voice <laughs> cutting out all the nonsense stuff yeah there's more than that than you think no oh, i'm sure yeah, I believe it. Yeah. Uh, well, let me ask you this then. So a lot of, um, I guess you could categorize it as machining companies, uh, hire people that don't necessarily have degrees or anything like that. Now, the only reason I ask this question is because a lot of people want to find their route in working within the industry. So do you hire people out of like needing to have an agree degree or do you just solely base it off experience? um yeah so we have like a licensed machinist we have like ticketed welders we have that and i yeah. do have two um full engineers that have their degree that work for me now so we have uh three total and i do depending on the role that they're playing mm -hmm. um, i do look for a lot of experience but then i also will like look at their Instagram account and I'll look at what they've done for <laughs> themselves. Stuff, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I would almost prefer that they just kind of like a sponsorship. If you want to work here, send me your proposal. <laughs> like, oh, that's nice. Send yeah. me, send me what, uh, Screw a resume. Yeah. Give me the highlights of, of what you do. And I want to see, because if you don't take pride in what you do for yourself, I don't think that it's going to be a good fit. Mm -hmm. Um, and we just like, you know, it's a lifestyle workplace. It's not just yeah. a job. And some people will see it as just a job and that's great. I don't want them to work here. I yeah. want them to see it as like they love coming here and they something to brag about, something to talk about, something to share with their family at the Thanksgiving dinner. Like mm -hmm. what what kind of stuff did you do this week? And I think that's great because um, that's like that's how I am at these dinners. And that's now, an interesting way to think about it as a business owner. I like that. Yeah. Both my parents work for me, work with me now. Oh, I didn't uh, know that. Yeah, my mom does the accounting. My dad does like kind of the HR dad of the shop manager yeah. kind of guy. Like they worked together for years and then they retired basically. And then my company, mostly because of all of the currency exchanges and how complicated mm -hmm. the books got, we needed someone to be full time on the accounting side of it. Gotcha. Shopify is pulling in currencies from every single country. And we, 
I can't match any of the bills because they're all, yeah. <laughs> they're all converted into Canadian and it's just a disaster. So like I couldn't do it. Well, actually speaking of that, are you, do you, I know you mentioned in a video that you do have plans of coming to the U S has mm -hmm. that always been kind of the goal? Cause I know owning a business in Canada is very restricted, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we'll keep that response a little shorter, but I would definitely love to be in the U S uh, with a physical location. Mm -hmm. Um, the more I come back here, man, the better it gets with looking at it as from an entrepreneurial side of things. Um, more opportunities. It definitely will result in we'll be here somehow mm -hmm. in the future. It's a three-year plan, kind of. Um, the sooner the better, but like realistically, I have to focus on building the assets of the company, reinvesting into the company, and making sure that we're like crossing our T's, dotting our I's, making sure everything has. Like right now, we're going back through every product and making a installation guides assembly guides and really detailed engineered drawings nice. um that's what we're doing so like everything was built to a standard that is needs to be it's understood well by car people mm -hmm. and it needs to be refined for everybody yeah not to say that anyone's that dumb or anything but new we to all to, of it yeah yeah we have to break it down so that anyone could understand it not just someone who's familiar with cars so like yeah that's what we're doing and we're going through everything with a fine tooth comb and we've been spending months on this. So like the development of new products has been pretty slow because of that, mm -hmm. but it's a necessary thing. If you went on our website, you would consistently see the spare parts pages and the installation guides like continuously being added for every product. And it's going to yeah. take a while because we have so many. Yeah, that's just, that's what we're doing. So with making parts and stuff, have you ever had like any failed endeavors that didn't even get to be highlighted or make it to the market or anything like that um kits that you really wanted to put out but just didn't quite work out yeah like we had a miata kit designed two years ago um for the mb chassis and that just never went to market mostly because the car we used to install it on never it still isn't finished being built and then it kind of just oh. slipped through the cracks and we've been asked multiple times but to revisit it we were just too busy um, there's probably five or 10 products that have been designed, drawings are done, Yeah, kits needing to be tested. And it's just kind of like sitting in the back <sighs> because we're too busy, honestly. Like we, we always anticipate a slow time in the, in the, in the season and it just never happens. Like yeah. we were like 90 to a hundred orders behind all the time. Damn. that. Yeah. And then the black Friday hits and we go f three to 400 orders behind. <sighs> Um, and currently our backlog is like a th two to three week wait time. Like it's, it's really reasonable right now. Um, just cause we're way more organized than we ever have been. And yeah, everyone's got assigned roles. I used to do all the roles and I wore way too many hats. Now, um, the guys have been, uh, stepping up, taking a role and like taking it upon themselves. Like you're in charge of this, you're in charge of this. And it's taken a little bit off my plate each time. Yeah. Um, but you're now I stress about it as those things get taken off the email load for, just like business related emails with people that either want to work with us or I have on the driver app on the driver side of things for sponsorships and, and having meetings. Like I'm, I've just been increasingly getting more and more busy with that stuff yeah. too. So it's been hard, hard to manage. Yeah. Well, hell yeah. You seem to have gotten it very organized from an outsider's perspective, especially after seeing the videos of a lot of the influence like LZ and all of them coming up to the shop and seeing around yeah. before the tour. Um, yeah. We did a little clean. We did a little yeah. clean before. I'm sure y'all I'm sure there was a little spit shine going <laughs> yeah, on there. Exactly. But, um, okay. Well, uh, my, I wanted to talk about this cause my first, I guess, opening to FDF was the Taylor Ray video okay. back in the day with the, the blue Z. Yeah. Um, so where was the company at in this stage? Because it seemed like after that, it was a heavy hit on uh, media and like marketing and stuff. Getting the yeah, product that would have been that would have been 2019 or 2018. I don't remember. It was four or five years ago. Yeah. Um, no, no idea who Taylor was at the time. This is how like new I kind of was to the drifting scene. Okay. Um, I honestly didn't know who he was. He sent us an email and just asked us he he gave us this this case that he wanted to create content around and he saw that our kid had been on like drift hq was a big partner of ours early mm -hmm. um duarte's been a good friend and like really 
amazing to work with and everything. So we kind of grew alongside them. They were, they had started quite before us, but mm -hmm. we've uh, quickly grown to be one of their best selling companies products. Yeah. Um, and we just work closely with them and they're awesome. So Drift HQ was selling products before Taylor had, had, had come about. And I think that he learned about us probably from them because they're both in Florida. Yeah. So from there, he just invited us to bring a kit, come and hang out, install it with them. And he would just drive it around and tell us how we, oh, how we yeah. thought of it and how okay. it handled and everything. And, and, uh, it, it just went really well and yeah. he loved it and he liked us and, he ended yeah. up selling that car very quickly, but <laughs> yeah, he sold it. I forget who he sold it to, but yeah, he sold it. But that's that's what I've learned with influencers: the turnover rate with content for them has to be ever changing. Yeah, or else people would never watch you rebuild your three fifty four times. No, it, they're done. Like yeah, you, no. you, you do one thing different. Maybe you can do do two things different to the same car, but after that, they they just don't care. Yeah. So he's an expert. He's he's moved on from companies to cars to kits to things to stuff and, oh. and some of his best yeah. content is honestly like remaking uh stuff around his house and building his shed and oh and that's that what RV i get and, sucked into is oh yeah <laughs> shop videos dude i love they do those. well they do really well and i mean it's it's great like he's found such a such a niche market for himself personally yeah. as someone that is very relatable to everybody yeah. Somehow anyone can relate to him. It's mind-boggling to me watching his videos because they're so not like low level, but like there's not simple. very much editing involved. Yeah. It's a simple video and it's yeah, he's still got it, consumable. He's got it figured out for sure. And and it really, you know, it, it it suits him really well because I don't think he he would do well with the high production, all this other stuff yeah. that would make him unrelatable. Yeah. So the fact that everything that he's doing seems obtainable is why so many people like him. I think that's my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, at this time though, did so how many kits were actually like on the market then? Uh, like the first, the first kits were S chassis. Second was three hundred and fifty. We might have had. Uh, I don't know. Like the, it was kits were not the first products. Like hood vents and, and really simple stuff. I was actually making mm -hmm. wing brackets first. Wow. universal wing brackets was like my my first product <laughs> where like i sold a trunk mount with like a basic l bracket and i sold like a bumper mount um the bumper mount was 350 bucks the trunk mount was like 200 150 mm -hmm. to 200 depending on design i would just change the cutout pattern and <laughs> and cut them out of a quarter inch or three eighths aluminum 60 61 and i would just like put them on the website and people yeah. would buy them and i'd ship them out and um That's it was kind of funny because dude. they I wouldn't even put holes in the top. I would say you need to drill them to fit your wing. Like, I don't know what <laughs> yeah. wing you have. And if if I did draw, like put the holes in the brackets for you, you might, maybe your trunks leaned like a G35 trunk kind of is yeah. on an angle, whereas a, other trunks are going to be flat. And like, so I just put no holes in the top. So like it had holes in the bottom for the bracket and had nothing in the top. And people were totally fine with like, getting a cool looking wing bracket and drilling their own holes. And that yeah, was I would like prefer a, that. Honestly, that was a really weird little, which <laughs> I had stopped selling. Like I don't sell <laughs> I should keep selling them because they were like the easiest thing, but I know I wanted to have that as a refined thing, like have the mm -hmm. trunk mounts specific to chassis because I did get a lot of emails where like the L bracket, which was basically a bent piece of steel, mm -hmm. like no trunk is flat. So like it didn't fit every trunk. They had to put like a foam piece and then bolt it through and, I got too many questions on like what's the best way to mount it to your trunk, and I'm like, it's a universal trunk mount bracket. Like it's just that's for you to it figure comes out. With, <laughs> it comes with some pieces and some parts, but this was like really premature. Yeah. Anything else, and like I didn't sell a lot of them, but they were great margin and oh, yeah. really easy to sell. So, well, what would you say? At, kind of was the kit or part that really set your business off in motion. To probably really start yeah probably the mantis kit like the, the z kit uh, the 240 was the first one and the whole reason the mantis name is what it is is because the first s chassis control arm looked like the arm of a praying mantis that's no the only way. reason that's the only reason it's called that i have no <laughs> oh my god that's i awesome. don't care about the the mantis shrimp or the bug the like a praying mantis i they're cool bugs yeah. but i or animals i don't really care about it. Like, i don't have any thing with to do with them yeah i'm not i don't have like tattoos or anything of them <laughs> like, it's just, i thought the name was like brandable 
And I was like, oh, like a Mantis kit or a, like Mantis angle. That'd be a cool sticker. Yeah, it's, like, got, that a, was, it's got a good ring to it. Or yeah, it was just like, hear it. Sh- like shooting the shit with a couple buddies. And that was like a word that just was kind of sticking. And then it just kind of ran with it. Like, what is that? Oh, it's a Mantis kit. And people just say it like it's a thing now. But I just made it up basically because that's what it looked like. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, um, so how have you like, because like you just mentioned a minute ago, you, you're you very busy all the time, especially making new products. And you can see that from an outsider perspective. How do you manage to be able to design all of these products? I know you got designers and stuff now. Yeah. But like still. That's... Um, I just got really good at doing it. Like honestly, I can design stuff relatively quickly and then put them through. So the reason it happens so fast is because we have CNC water jet. Mm-hmm. Um, we have three Haas CNC machines. We have the 3D scanner. We have the welders. We yeah. have everything that you can think of to build something like tomorrow. We have it. So yeah. I mean, and y'all did was, an LZ kit in like less than what ten yeah, hours or something. It's it's all based on the the reinvestment into the company and not drawing a salary. Like I'm just yeah. basically I support myself with the minimal amount required to to yeah. continue to reinvest in the company. And once I have enough assets built within the company. I'll probably borrow against it. We'll move into a bigger building or we'll come to the US or we'll have two locations or something. But that's like, you got to think long term and you can't go for quick gratification. Like you just can't. So Hmm. um, what was the original question? Um, Well, just how how you're able to fastly, like very fast come out with new products and design them and stuff. Well, yeah, like that's that's basically the answer to that is like I can can produce the product relatively quickly. Like I designed a gas pedal on Friday last week and I posted a video about it. It's a throttle gas pedal that bolts into a Corvette, essentially a universal pedal because the bracket is just like a flat plate. Yeah. And I posted about it and then all of a sudden I got all these comments and all these messages like sell it, sell it, sell it, I'll buy it, how much, how much? And I'm like... I designed it on Friday. We'll have it cut. <laughs> Give on, me a second. Hold on. I'll have it cut by Tuesday. Um, I already made this gas yeah. pedal. So like I already have it on my car. So I know it, it works. I just didn't simulate it on, on CAD. Gotcha. So the simulation with like the spring and stuff, like it took like an hour or something, but it's worth it because people love seeing stuff like that. And then uh, that'll be done like probably Wednesday. Like my guys just know what to do. <laughs> When the parts are cut, Dude. the CAD models created, they look at the CAD, they build they build the products. I make everything like align itself with uh, like tongue and groove style mm-hmm. uh, weldments. So you're plug welding this and it, it just fits together. And yeah, like we can produce something in three to five days. That's like a powder coated finished product. Jeez. I have a bolt pin that has a million bolts in it <laughs> from every size metric to imperial, yeah. like you name it. It's it's very long and it's got a lot of bolts in it. <laughs> Whatever bolt I can grab off McMaster car and throw in my model, we have it already. What we all wish we had in our own shops. Right. Just... But I mean, it's like, I don't know. I probably spend a quarter million dollars with Fastenal every God. year. So it's like, it comes at a cost. <laughs> yeah, of course. Of course. Well, how, like, how have you managed or not managed, but chosen which cars need to come next because like right now you're focused on the corvette mainly and you're pumping a lot out with that but going through the s chassis the z and then even to like s2000 kits and like yeah so unfortunately it was uh designing products for whatever i wanted to and that's kind of this is just personal it i mean that's how it started so that obviously has uh been contentious in the shop because they're like okay, you need to do this chassis and products like this because our margins are better here and the products are easier to design here. But it's like, oh, but I don't want to do that. That doesn't sound very fun. (laughs) (laughs) So like I'm just used to, um, my brother owned a a mechanics shop and I could see him, like I saw him doing uh, steering racks and Dodge minivans and brake jobs on old vehicles. Like, And he just, yeah, you get the odd fun job, Mm. but most of the time you're doing stuff that you don't want to do. And I was big on like, I want to do what I want to do. And that's why we started with angle kits because it was solving problems for myself and my friends. And then it kind of grew from there. But to decide what to design, Mm -hmm. we kind of have a little committee now, which is pretty new of my lead hands of guys. And we're just going to, we're just going to decide that this is more advantageous to start than, than to continue with this chassis because this chassis, we just look at all the analytics and we're like, okay, this, this car is 
yeah, we get people that are passionate about the car and they message us about it, but like this chassis is better. Yeah. Um, so we're focusing on some some grip stuff. Um, we're designing and installing some some track stuff that's not drifting anymore, mm -hmm. which we're going to always do drifting and we have a team big enough to continue that aspect of the company. But uh, drifters are really the, the I'm not going to say the cheapest, but I could say that they're I know the cheapest. I mean, yeah. But yeah, it's it's a young crowd that that Pinny has pinchers. fun. Yeah, we don't have we don't have a lot of money. I didn't have a lot of money, <laughs> and that's just the the niche market. But it is the most fun, and the people are the best. So we yeah. want to maintain that lifestyle going forward. But we also need to have good enough margins to pay everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And plus, you wouldn't have wanted to start in another area of motorsports that yeah, you didn't I wasn't, really know anyways so or not necessarily didn't know just but, not passionate yeah, about it exactly like, we were passionate about drifting because of the the friendships and the people and how much fun it was like whenever you go to an event driving is 25 percent hanging oh, out yeah. hanging out with your own pit is 25 percent hanging out with other people's pits 25 <laughs> yeah. percent. and then like honestly just the camaraderie is like the rest of it you just are so happy to be there and hanging out with people your voice is gone every time after the oh, event yeah. because you're just talking to everyone and everyone is like-minded it's difficult to go to a place where everyone is on the same page and has the same story to get there it's hard to get there like, oh yeah yeah that's you know, that's the beauty of drifting how's the 350 going oh it's it's great it's running and stuff it's in pieces right now because i'm the rack was blown so i'm replacing that and recently finally blue or it was always blown so I think it blew from being dry for probably two years. Dry. Yeah. Like I didn't have any fluid in it while oh. I was doing the swap for okay. so long. <laughs> Got it. And Rusted on like some surface. Yeah, surface I think rust. so. But it like the it didn't leak that bad with regular power steering fluid um, whenever I was trying to bleed it. And then I went and did the test day, got like two laps. It was basically undrivable without power steering. So yeah. um, I brought it back home, threw some ATF in it because that's what everyone was telling me to do. So I was like, all right, did that. And then it just started like squirting out of the passenger side of the rack. So Seal's gone. Yeah. Did you have yeah. offset rack spaces on it before that? Uh, no, not with the old kit. No, uh, but I do now with the FTF kit. And now I won't be because I'm doing the rack. Rack relocation. relocation. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a lifesaver for for keeping your rack good yeah like my s14 never had it so. yeah never had an offset rack space for that was like the first thing i did was relocated and that rack has been there for seven years yeah that's the car we were that's why i'm here i sold it to a to a customer in oh Oklahoma. oh okay okay yeah that's why i'm in the u.s right now gotcha and i got to drive it for the last the last hurrah which is cool with the new owner yeah um he's 63 uh Holy. he he wants to compete at a high level and this is the car That's sick yeah he's a he's a very interesting man a yeah. very cool man yeah yeah i could i he's a he would become a great mentor if we maintain any kind of a a relationship this guy yeah. was super cool hell um, yeah and he you know he was following me as as in like at, for entertainment for him and checking out the channel and oh, I bet emailing us good. yeah he wanted me to build a car for him and then i'm like well, i'm selling this and it's, <laughs> just take my old one it's ready it's to rock tried and, and true I'm like, it's going to need a body kit. Though. <laughs> yeah, your body kit. The body kit. The car's, ran been, through. The car's been used properly and yeah. the outside. It's it's a function over form car yeah. at this point. That car's a, it's always been a weapon, though. Oh, yeah. The, the way it sounds has always been unique to everyone else, which you said that's just small clutch, right? Yeah, it's just minimum part. rotating mass, like lower, yeah. less inertia. It's, it's yeah, it's it's a signature sound that I've I've maintained for a long time. It's a little bit harder to drive, but everyone, it's worth it. Like everyone thinks it sounds sick. And it makes yeah. driving anything else seem really easy. Does it so. feel like more of an on off switch, basically, having that small oh, yeah. clutch? Yeah, but it, it just, it makes you a better driver because it's more difficult to drive. And that's not, a, that's not good advice to give to somebody, yeah. make it more difficult for yourself. But when you reach a certain level, keeping your senses in tune with what you're doing and your reaction times like extremely fast and mm -hmm. having to maintain throttle while handbraking to have enough, uh, like you're in the right power band to get back on throttle. And yeah. all of that type of work is, you know, good practice. If you want to get into a supercharged car or add nitrous, it's going to seem like you're cheating. 
basically. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a, it's just like driving a turbo. Like if you're not in the top end of this engine, it'll fall off really fast. Mm -hmm. But it's got tons of power in the top end. So like, you just keep it there. Everyone thinks it sounds cool. You get a lot of uh, attention for it, and the the announcers talk more about it, and it just is better. Like it just, mm -hmm. I think it's just better for more reasons than. Um, the minimal performance it may add because if anything a heavier flywheel is going to help you more in drifting yeah the clutch kicks are going to be more uh, they're going to do more for you if you have a big flywheel behind you because that that momentum is going to keep the tires spinning yeah more service for me to break it too. for me to break the tires free it's all engine like there's no, yeah. there's no rotating Jesus. mass to help me out um okay so with so why did you actually come to the decision of selling that car then uh building a second corvette to okay to to mimic the first one um i'm doing some serious competitions with the first one that i can't talk about but uh basically i'm building a neck another one to practice in yeah and that's going to be essential for my next stage of like uh me as a driver and then marketing as a company and all these other things so we're doing a lot of really cool things with that car that would probably make this podcast four hours long if I started talking about it. Um, and then, you know, yeah. people are going to see it. It's going to it's gonna be a content driver that's going to further what what my pages look like and what my channel looks like this year. Yeah. I think we're going to see the biggest growth uh, yet this year with this new build. So I have that Corvette in the trailer. Um, I bought oh, okay. it. I bought it in Utah off a of friend, Eric Welch. Um, in Utah, he helped me get it to, um, Rob Parson, cage kids. Yep. So he did the roll cage in it just as a, not as a favor, but he gave me a really good deal and we did a little promotion for him and, and he threw That's it in awesome. because like time wise, I know the welders there. I've met him at, uh, FD and stuff and they're all great guys. And I'm like, yeah, I trust you guys to weld this in. I wouldn't trust yeah. anyone else. <laughs> I've done my due diligence. I've put in like hundreds of roll cages, like. I'm I'm kind of over it. Like you guys yeah. can put it in. You guys made a great product. So they put it in. The car's caged. It's just a rolling chassis in my trailer and we're bringing that home to build into the second Corvette. So I'll have two matching Corvettes that basically mimic each other, but the one is going to have a power adder that I just won't talk about right now, but it's no one's used it before and uh, my brother specializes in oh. it and it's going to make a lot of horsepower. So, Holy shit. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it's never been done in drifting yeah so we'll just say that so it's not what you're thinking yeah all probably. right fair <laughs> okay so why did you okay well why was the the corvette the choice for that chassis to go that in depth on then oh well, that's a good question um basically i don't think that it was uh i don't think it's been properly developed yet basically only by watching the the so many guys that are using the chassis right now yeah it is such a fantastic road race car and it has all of the characteristics that you want in a road race car that's why it was engineered that way it was actually a race car first and then it was made into a production car so the suspension gotcha. design emulates like an f1 style suspension okay. you have a, a double wishbone with a very simple knuckle everything is super lightweight um the camber curve the the toe control the front knuckle is actually the same knuckle as that's on the back you just take the front left you flip it and you put it on the rear no right. way yeah, it's the same knuckle front and back. Like what? If you'd buy two Corvette knuckles, though, those are front or rear. They're both. So that's cool Cheat about. Codes, hell yeah. Yeah. So everything was simplified and made for a race car. But what that does is, it makes it not a that desirable of a production car suspension in mm. terms of road comfort and like driving over bumps and driving on highways and yeah, stuff. Yeah, it's gonna be very feels stiff. like a race car. Yeah. So the only reason cars have like 350s have multi-link is because multi-link handles bumps and it's comfortable. Yeah. It's okay. a, it's a, it's a production car. Like it's meant to be comfortable for the average person. So the Corvette had been underdeveloped in my opinion, and it needed help to become a drift car. Okay. Um, right now it has a steering rack that was in a horrible location in the front. Uh, it has really minimal travel. It was designed to be a, uh, heavy rated suspension that has minimal travel and big sway bars and it's great for cornering. Mm -hmm. It's got a really wide track width, uh, a perfect wheelbase. So like to develop this car into what I thought it could be was why. Yeah. And then it's a frame rail chassis, which a lot of people look at it and they think uh, 
that that's like oh that's not that big of a deal like a unibody newer newer unibody cars are just as rigid and stuff as that car but what they don't realize is that all the weight of the car is in the bottom it's all right at the ground so okay. you have two massive frame rails that are like you know eight to nine yeah. inches tall and six inches wide and those are running the entire length of the car um and they don't go any higher than like two two and a half feet off the ground like that's your highest points which are your front frame rails that sit between the engine the engine okay. sits almost level with the frame rails oh and wow then there's no structure above that so when you think of a unibody car you've got strut towers you've got yeah the entire roof is in is integral to the rigidity of the chassis if you cut the mm -hmm. roof out the car is flimsy yeah so yes maybe a 240 stripped down is 380 or 400 pounds stripped fully just a unibody and a Corvette is like uh, 450 to 480 depending. And yeah, they're about the same weight. 240 is a little okay. bit lighter, but all of that weight, the center of gravity of the chassis torn down to nothing is probably half a foot to a foot lower on the Corvette than it is on a 240 right off the bat. So you've got Dude. a much better center of gravity rate yeah, without yeah. doing anything. And uh, the chassis is super rigid. If you've ever noticed on a Corvette, if you jack one front corner, the rear yeah. tire comes up almost, almost immediately. And that's just due to how rigid this chassis was built. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of that is to do with the transmission tunnel too. It's just like a, like it's a pretty thick gauge steel, alloy okay. steel, and it's huge. And a lot of the strength, because most of the Corvettes were target tops, so the middle comes out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That tunnel is, like, very integral as well to the chassis rigidity. And it was, like, really well designed, reinforced, and mm. built. Um, it's also a transaxle car. And, yeah, it's just a – it's a built race car. Like, when you, yeah, yeah, when you build course. it, you're building a race car. You're not trying to work with a, <laughs> a production car. Yeah. So that's why. So when going, I guess going into building it, doing the amount of sensors and the amount of like just stuff you added to the suspension components, was that all just solely for research purposes? Yeah. Like just to add all of that stuff? Yeah. Or did like, you want to be able to see it for competing wise? So it's both. You can't, you can't uh, determine anything without a baseline. So you need something yeah. to refer to. And if I was to make an adjustment on the car, it would solely be based off of feeling uh, okay. and not off of any data. So in order to make a calculated decision, you have to have the data to support it. Mm -hmm. And collecting that data for a year is really important. Basically, yeah. I'm doing nothing with the data. I'm simply reading what the car did, reviewing the event that I, that I participated in, yeah. and then saying, was this good or was this not good? And then you see the data and then you correlate that with being good or not good. And then you build okay. up a inventory of reports until you finally reach a point where you can look at that data and say, when my car was feeling good, it was at this data reading. My car isn't feeling good right now and it's not at this data reading. So how do we get it to be the same as when mm -hmm. I said it was good? So then you make adjustments to the, gotcha. to the car based on the data. And yeah. it takes a lot of time and investment to do that. So, a lot like, of studying. <laughs> yeah. So, right now, it's just collecting, just collecting. You save it as a file, and then you're you're saving it to basically look at it later. Yeah. Um, so yeah. there's no. You probably don't have an example of one thing that you've noticed from specifically that data that has been a major change to help the car drive better. Yeah. So I did a lot of um, data on any squat on during drifting, and okay. I was basically testing the different positions reading what the potentiometers were saying mm -hmm. and then you just take notes and basically how does that translate to performance and drifting and it's really dependent on the track i'm going to say this really quickly because we, we shouldn't talk about it for very long but like <laughs> a high percentage of any squat reduces the ability of the suspension to work but it adds pressure to the tire okay so if you have a really bumpy track high any squat would be bad and gotcha. if you want to have good control on a track that is quite rough terrain like a new jersey track for example yeah. the road course or the or the oval is pretty yeah, bad the too. ovals um disgusting. you probably <laughs> want to lower any squat just to maintain tire contact with the uh track because if you have high any squat you're going to be oh. bouncing over over points on the track and then um in in relation to that if you have a really smooth track and there isn't too much suspension change then you want to uh add more any squat and mm -hmm. basically 
you can kind of take away from what the dampening has to do in order to maintain traction. So to, in short, like if you want good traction, it is track dependent and any squat is not a linear. That's better always. Yeah. Like it's not how yeah. it works. And I have the data to prove that. So it's not like anyone can be like, I'm wrong. Cause I, I'm probably <laughs> the only one that actually has done this extensive with both my chassis. Yeah. Um, and it was crazy cause I was just playing with everything and I'm like, yeah, I'm probably the, the only one sending my car through the maximum amount. And if you want to mm -hmm. see any subjective change in any given area, you need to go to the extremes to notice any difference. Because if you change okay. something by 10%, you likely as a driver won't know, especially mm -hmm. in drifting, because you're not basing it off track times. You're basing it off of, I hope if you're comparing anything, you initiated the exact same point, going the exact same speed with the exact same track temperatures, with the exact same tire mm -hmm. and the exact same wheel speed. <laughs> likely never that's never going to happen no nope. so you can't Not actually you can't actually make a 10 percent change uh you can at a pro level you definitely can but you can't actually subjectively say this is going to be better and i felt it because like, yeah well what yeah. else changed did the temperature go down on the track and you increase grip on the tire did your warm-up was was you know 20 seconds less so that you had less heat in the tire like what 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 else what other variables Dude. did you consider when you said <laughs> most that, people don't <laughs> exactly exactly so at a pro level with a very experienced driver we can change things i would say within a five percent accuracy window but most people you're looking at like a 30 percent range yeah. like it's like if you golf all the time you can you can get it on the green and then if you golf a couple times a year dude you're just swinging hopefully it goes straight oh, dude every time i i hate golfing because every time i do it i swing and it just cuts right or cuts left because i've always had a baseball but you're good swing. with the irons like the irons are okay or is that just the driver oh no both? it's all of them oh, yeah i'm bad I can putt with, <laughs> right so i like the driver for me always slices but i'll literally shoot to the left and then it'll end up <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> it'll end up down the down the straight but the irons i'm great with um not that that That's relates, hilarious. but it does relate because in golfing, you have that much of a difference between pro and amateur. Yeah. And it's the same in drifting. Like you, I'm not talking about the top 10 guys in, in FD. They can feel one PSI. I can feel one PSI. Like we can, we know this difference. Yeah. But that's driving a chassis for four or five years that's driving all the time that's multiple different chassis and, yeah you know yeah. you know what's a good setup and you know what it should do whereas most people are like i think it should do this yeah and you know they don't know what their alignment is their tires are, are like the pressures or whatever came off the tire changer at like oh yeah you can go up to a bunch of people at the track and ask them what their tire pressure is and half of them will be like honestly i don't even know yeah it's uh it's, it's good what? it's good <laughs> <That's> <laughs> okay <laughs> like, uh, they just say yes. What's your pressure at? Yes. I don't yes. Know. <laughs> yeah. Hell yeah. Uh, well, on that anti squat thing, is there is there any chassis that you would say a high amount of anti squat on a regular basis is a good thing? Uh, it depends on what you consider high. So there is no yeah, there is no perfect percentage on that that you can say yeah, sixty percent is going to be the best. Although that might be a good starting point. Um, any squat on some cars can be adjusted with ride height and on others it can't be. So for example, mm -hmm. on anything that has to do with a trailing suspension. So if you got a live axle or a trailing arm, like a BMW, yeah. um, ride height is going to be the main thing that, that changes your any squat. And as the car compresses, it loses percentage. Okay. Um, I could illustrate that. No, I just won't bother. <laughs> um, so then, but then on, on multi-link, you have something that's a little bit different, um, S chassis has a traction arm that increases and decreases in anti squat percentage, but then the lower stays linear and actually increases. Uh, so that's complicated. I'll use something different. A Corvette actually increases in anti squat as it compresses. So okay. the reason for that is it's a double A arm mounted parallel to the direction of travel. Yeah. So my lower control arm is mounted on the chassis on an angle. So as I apply a force on the wheel and the arm pivots Twist, yeah. it, it's going to push the wheel down into the ground and if i flatten that arm out it's going to reduce my any squat oh. but the trick is because that angle never changes as the car compresses my center of gravity becomes in line with the control arm angle <laughs> and it increases so the corvette and a few other cars are the only ones that actually increase any squat percentage as the car compresses meaning oh, if a corvette wow. squats you, what you're going to have as a as a reaction is an increased pressure to the tire 
into the pavement okay. as the car compresses. This is unique because a BMW, as it compresses, loses anti-squat percentage. So oftentimes you would find That's, that if, that yeah. if, if you want to hire anti-squat on a BMW, you're going to just raise the car if you want mm -hmm. that. On a Corvette, it's kind of different. You have to, you have to consider more, more things because mm -hmm. as the car compresses, which may not be a bad thing, it could be easier to sustain the drift. It's going to increase the pressure as it compresses. So at one point it will stop compressing due mm -hmm. to the pressure yeah, on the yeah. tire. And this could be really beneficial for you in terms of like bumpy tracks because you're going to increase the grip on the tire as the car is kind of absorbing the bumps where a BMW mm -hmm. is going to be decreasing the pressure on the tire. So it really is, there's no perfect chassis, there's no perfect it's setup. So but, interesting though. But uh, understanding it clearly with data to back it up is important. Yeah. Um, I know a lot of people have their opinions, but it's just opinions. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's got those. Okay. Uh, so jumping back on like building the C6, uh, was there any mistakes or like hiccups that you ran into on that car that didn't get highlighted at all in your content or anywhere else? Uh, yeah, playing with the steering rack options that I wanted to run. Uh, I messed around with way more than I had uh, put in the videos. So like we had tried 180 racks upside down. We had tried... 350 Jay-Z. I basically had scans of all these racks, 3D scans. And oh, I was okay, just, yeah. I was throwing them into the the CAD file and like seeing how they would fit. Yeah. And then uh, we ended up with the E46 rack and it just fit between the subframe uh, casting perfectly. And like you had to notch this one little, you got to grind this one little spot <laughs> and it essentially bolts in. Like it, it'll bolt in within no 20 way. minutes. Yeah. Um, then we made the adapter for the stock steering shaft to connect to the, the bmw rack yeah like, with just a little machine adapter um jonathan hurst has the kit right now he's doing a like a civilian install basically he's a smart dude that uh that, oh, that owns cash. a shop yeah he owns a shop so like it he, it's not really a civilian doing it but uh he made a motor mount because my car has an engine plate so he made a motor mount to help with those that have like stock corvettes that want to go with this kit and gotcha. i actually met him on saturday night i think uh passing through st louis and we met up we had dinner he gave me the motor mount um, i gave him the products and he had them on like the next day like front and rear um, sending me pictures giving me calls um, and stuff like that telling me his thoughts and everything while they're fresh and so that motor mount's going to help with with people but that was really the only thing that i like didn't didn't account for was uh mm. The, the rack situation was like, that was like a year and a half ago. That was super early in the build. And then uh, rear rear suspension design and getting the motion ratio right for the right amount of travel, that took a while. Mm -hmm. That had like two versions of control arms to get the most amount of travel with a... I ended up using the front coilovers in the back as well. Okay. And so I actually have four coilovers all identical around the car. Oh. And uh, they use the same mounts, they're the same length, and they're the same spring rate. <laughs> The Dude. rear is a the rear is an 18k spring with a, a different motion ratio than the front, and the front is an 18k spring. So they're actually the wheel rate is different, what? but they use the same spring rate. Okay, so I like I may just be ignorant in this area, but how? Because usually you would want the softer spring rate in the rear. How how are you able to manage? You uh, may have, have already answered this, but yeah. So the motion ratio. So essentially. In the rear, to keep it simple, let's say I have a two to one wheel rate. Okay. So basically, at, with an 18K spring, if I have a two to one motion ratio, my wheel rate's gonna be like nine, nine K. Um, it's actually more Holy than that, shit. but to keep it simple, it's let's just say it's two to one. And the front is like 1.68 to one. So the front is significantly stiffer. It's gonna be more. So if you have a McPherson strut car, which you okay. have a 350, so you have. Yeah a double wishbone which means you are dealing with motion ratio motion ratio that mm -hmm. means the control arm is where the spring connects to and the control yeah, arm yeah. acts as a lever on the spring with the pressure on the tire so if you're running a 14k spring on a 350 or a 16k spring it might be the same as running like an 8k spring on a 240 which is a mcpherson strut yeah so mcpherson strut the shock is the strut and the the pressure of the wheel is almost one to one with the spring gotcha that makes okay. sense yeah yeah, yeah. so because the coilover goes right to the strut tower yeah and then the coilover bolts to the wheel basically mm -hmm. so that's like pretty much one to one 
ratio. Um, what you yeah, have on the spring sense. rate is what your wheel rate is, but your 350 has a motion ratio. So your 350's wheel rate is going to be different than what your spring rate is. And uh, so the 350, uh-huh. I'm trying to use your car as an example yeah. so you can understand. The 350's rear, because you probably converted it from a bucket to a true. Yes. Yes. Okay. So if you had a divorced coilover, the spring mm-hmm. would have been on the bucket. You would probably be running a 14K spring on that bucket. Yeah. But okay, because you converted yeah. to a true, you're probably running a 5 or 6K spring. Both of those equaling out to being the same wheel rate. Yeah. But because of the leverage that the bucket has that's on insane. the wheel, you have a uh, motion ratio. So that's so. Actually, speaking of the 350Z kit, the um, how you you manage to do it to where the shock mount can adjust is yeah, that what stiffer, that relates to? Yeah, stiffer and okay. softer without changing the spring. So okay. you can increase and it is the, further out is stiffer, right? Yeah, correct. Okay. Just yeah. want to make sure, because <laughs> mm-hmm. I like the I really like the front end stiff, and I've never understood the really loose. Like you have to have a big bar front and all that stuff. That doesn't feel right to me. You have to have a big sway bar if you run a light spring. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. You got to have a big sway bar. The sway bar shares the rate based on the weight transfer. So, like, if you have an eight and an eight, and you start turning as as that pressure increases on the outside tire, for example, mm-hmm. I'm talking about racing right now. <laughs> so, as you're turning to the to the left, the pressure is going to increase on the right tire. Yeah, the sway bar is going to distribute the load from the rate that you have available on the other side and apply it to the side that's getting compressed. So a, a big sway bar it's shares so cool. rate um, left to right and keeps the car stable, but it allows you to have good bump control while driving straight. So okay. it depends. There's a good there's a good ratio that you should be going with. And a lot of people just keep, they'll just increase the rate of their spring mm-hmm. until it feels good. But the but the problem with that is, is um, it's just going to be too too stiff and you're going to end up understeering a little premature Mm -hmm. versus having a lighter spring and a big bar is going to control understeer better and you're going to have a little more grip up front now this also depends on tires that you're running in the front and rear and the ratio between that but it's just in like to keep it simple that's that's why (laughs) it's simple to you (laughs) it's just mind-boggling to me um okay so um on the the Corvette stuff again. Are you? Do you plan on doing that level of build on any other type of chassis to do like that extensive of research, or do you? Th- or does no, like no other chassis really. really need it? Uh, not really. We're doing it actually. We're kind of doing it with Connor Oselli and the E46. Um, I I did a lot of work on the rear of that car, and we're actually going to install it. I'm going to his house tonight. Yeah. Um, he lives about three hours away. And I have those products in the trailer that we're going to work together to install, set up, film some content around it. And yeah, so we're, we're developing that car with them. Um, so the E46 and the S14 and the Corvette will be like on a pro level, the most developed chassis that I've worked with. Yeah. Um, and then anything else beyond that, uh, we have developed, but sense. it's not to that extent. Okay. Okay. Because I, I was always curious, because that's got to be, very, and even with sponsor stuff, it's, that's an expensive build just to do research on. And uh, I yeah, yeah. I don't really see any other chassis needing that much of research with how much the aftermarket backing is for all of them. But it is. Uh, but so many people watched it, and so many people took a lot of um, points from it and applied it to their own car, even that's though good. it's unrelated. And people are buying products because of that. So it's not even related to that chassis specifically. Like, I'm not saying that I'm only catering to the Corvette community. I'm yeah, definitely yeah, catering no. to everybody and yeah. applying this as kind of a universal blanket statement. Mm-hmm. Apply it as you will sort of thing. Gotcha, gotcha. Is there any, uh, like, universal parts that have come from the Corvette that you've been able to market? Mm, yes. The sway bar blade kit is universal. Um, okay. I sell the the female and the male splined end, and then the blades in various lengths. You can choose on our website, and then uh, I have a McMaster car part number for you to pick the bushings that I use because it's oh, not. It doesn't sweet. make sense for me. They're oil impregnated brass bushings that that they work really well. They last a long time, and they're like fourteen dollars on McMaster car. So it's like I'm not gonna. 
here's a link. You guys are in the US. If you order it, it's probably cheaper than if I order it. Yeah, so yeah, exactly. I don't get a deal on McMaster Car. So you guys order it and here's the part number. So like anyone in the US can buy from McMaster Car. It'll be there the next day and uh, I just give you the part number. But that, that was a good universal product. It's It kind of caters to a little bit of everyone, dra mm -hmm. racing, drag, drift, whatever. Like it's, yeah. it's done pretty well. So what, uh, all right, then what is going to be like the end goal with this car? Like what, what are you shooting for in the future? You'll find out in like a month what it's going to be used. To. Damn it. <laughs> I tried. Gonna, I tried. Every, everyone's going to find out in like a month what, what that. I've heard some be. rumors and some speculation and stuff. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's going to be announced in a, in a fairly big public way. So we're going to just wait. That's good. Yeah. That's good. You did say you're not doing FD though, right? That's correct. This yeah. year. Okay. Do you plan on it eventually? You want to come? Um, if it makes sense. It? So the thing with FD is I'm just, I'm very, we're, we're, we're pretty well established in the U.S. and in North America. So like yeah. to, I need to expand the horizon with international dealers, working with people in different countries and doing all of that. So that's kind of the main focus is just brand awareness and, and going kind of global with the company. Yeah. Um, North America will continue to be, worked on but as a team and a team is kind of assigned to to maintaining this uh this market and we're kind of just going to continue to expand and yeah yeah okay is there is there any like specific market outside of north america that you're trying to primarily focus on or is no. that something you can't talk no about we've too? we sell a lot of stuff to dubai we sell a lot of stuff to japan new zealand Dubai, really yeah yeah europe's pretty good not the greatest europe's probably the weakest right now um and yeah a lot to dubai pretty much the guys that i know there they say it's like 90 percent fdf they're like holy pretty much shit. pretty much everyone in the drift scene has an fdf kit that's um, sick i would probably um credit that to uh nasser who has been who's been running my products for probably five six years yeah. he's won the dubai championship i forget what it's called so forgive me but he's uh he's won first twice and he's had our products on his 350 for like five years Damn. so he's been he's been loving that um and he's doing really great so I, I can't wait to compete with him soon um he came over and rented a car for the 50k oh nice and he rented a e36 i forget yeah yeah he rented an e36 and did pretty good for showing up and driving hell yeah it was What's like the most unique car out there that you know of your kit is on? Um, that's, I, I Genesis, would never guess like, that. Yeah, there's there's Genesis out there. There's it's pretty standard. Like you're you're talking a lot of Japanese and yeah. it's it's gonna be mostly Japanese. You'll see some BMWs and stuff, but nothing crazy. Okay. Um yeah, except for Sultan, he's building like mid engine Porsche drift cars and he's doing crazy stuff. Uh, yeah, that's he has a Corvette. I don't, I don't know if you know who that is, but Oh yeah. Yeah, he's been doing some really cool stuff as well out there. Same series as as Nasser. Yeah. So they're they're all cool guys out there. That's awesome. Hell yeah. Oh, I wanted to jump on um so partnership stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, cuz like I I sent you my resume specifically like I just wanted you to review it and like give your advice or if any advice there was, whatever it was. But what do you kind of look for when people are approaching you in a sense of sponsorship or anything like that? Like what? Uh, yeah, I don't. So the the actual partnership proposal is is quickly reviewed, like mm -hmm. pretty quickly, and it doesn't really go beyond that unless uh, there's there's some actual activation behind it. So yeah, for example, a lot of guys that have gotten to work with me or I've worked with them is they've kind of um, just decided that they want to be an advocate for the company because they like the company before they ask for anything. They um, are active in like uh, forums and, and drifting groups on Facebook. And yeah. like these people, I much rather sponsor than anyone asking for free stuff due to their, uh, you know, like self-proclaimed position in drifting. <laughs> yeah. um, whether or not they like they do, they do prospect or whatever, I just want an active person. Like I want someone who mm. is... Um, takes pride in what they're doing. That's big. Cause that's how, what, that's the same type of people that I hire. Yeah. And yeah, so I look for that and I'll, I'll definitely look you up on Facebook and I will definitely look at your Instagram, whether you tag it or not. And I'll look at those things and how active you are as a driver. Um, 
and what kind of products you you're already running like if if some guy's running yeah. a kit and he's got a recent uh promotion that he's done for for that company that we compete with and he's just trying to jump ship to the next thing yeah like it's not going to work out but someone who like has bought fdf two years ago they've been running it for a long time they've been building themselves as a driver they've been slowly gaining uh followers and, and people and they're really consistent and they're um just great guys like i'll i'll throw them uh, uh a sponsorship pretty pretty easily yeah yeah but you know that takes a lot of dedication and you kind of have to not take the first free handout you get so mm -hmm. i value people a lot more than than just getting an roi return on investment from these guys yeah um, that's interesting so it's it's like if i can invest in somebody that's going to be around for a while i'd much rather do that than just get a quick i want you to make eight posts and 20 stories yeah and do this. yeah like that kind of stuff is like i hate script i hate that i i love organic content that's like real and you didn't redo the shot eight times with a sighted thing you did it because you wanted to do it and you're saying it because you actually like it and like that's what i want so you kind of have to do it differently um we get a lot of proposals we get oh i'm sure hun hundreds of them that's why i wanted to ask because that it seems like from what you just explained like the proposal isn't even doesn't do anything for you like is, there's nothing a part of the proposal that really i look at the amount, your eye other than just yeah. who this person is i look at the amount of effort that it took basically yeah. and then i gauge like what i'm gonna do with that and hopefully they put hyperlinks in it so i yeah. can just click on their page like that's I, something i had to fix yeah i put hi <laughs> i put hyperlinks in mine and i whether people click on it or not it's way easier than typing yeah. in my name on all these different apps so yeah. if they don't have a hyperlink that's like it's not it's not a it's not the end of the world but like if i'm trying to go through like 40 in an evening to just like get through them and get it done and reach out to the ones that I think were good. I think it needs to be like really seamless for mm. time because I really don't have the time to do this. I'm running my own marketing uh, like driver program. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I'm investing a lot of time into that and I don't necessarily need to do anything other than that. Mm. I would just like to because you never know who you're going to meet and you never know who, um, what this person's going to do. And some of them are just amazing. Like some of these yeah. guys are just the best. So I'm really happy that I'm still open to it but it's definitely a little more fine tooth and i'm not picking nearly as many people on average how many how many do you get on a monthly or that's probably a terrible way to put that or how many do you pick per year i guess would be an easier um, way to ask that like 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 a contract signed sponsored drivers it, it might be less than 10 yeah yeah, less than 10, um, but they're all really solid dudes. Like, you know who they are. Micah Diaz is one of them. Dylan mm -hmm. Hughes, Jonathan Hurst. Like, they're they're fantastic people. So yeah, um, they're, they're going to be great friends for a long time. They're going to be great product runners. And, like, you know, if, if a better deal came up, I wouldn't I wouldn't steer them away from doing that. I've, I don't give money. I've never given anyone any money yeah. ever. Um, and that's just because, you know, what I bring to their program is a lot of information and a lot of, they can reach out to me and ask whatever they want. Yeah. More that's, valuables come along with it. They're not going to get that from anyone else. And, you know, uh, as a, as a shop, we charge like $250 to do like a custom design, for example. And okay. it, at that rate, that's kind of what you're getting access to for free. Mm -hmm. Um, not that I'm putting that value on my time for, with them kinda because should, I, though. well, I'm friends with In them. Sense. So the friendship doesn't come at a cost. It comes at like they, I value them as a person and what they yeah, have yeah. to, not just what I can gain from them, but I thoroughly enjoy spending time with these guys. So it's, it's a, it's a two way street for us. And that's the type of relationship that I want with, with these people. I don't want it to be like, what can I get from you and what I'm going to do for you in return? It's, that's mm. okay on a business side of things, but I'm way more interested in investing in people that just yeah. will be there as yeah, mentors I mean, and friends hell just having conversations with people and just getting to know people has i've seen has been more valuable to the podcast for one mm -hmm. rather than just trying to sell something or you know anything like that yeah like you running this podcast the the, the best thing to come from it is meeting people the people behind oh, yeah. yeah behind the face behind the pages behind whoever you get on here you now have a texting first name basis relationship with a person just yeah. because you had them on your show for two hours and that is going to result in you know never ending uh 
you know, it goes both ways. Opportunities for both of you. Routes that I can take in multiple different ways just because I have connections to different aspects of the industry, which is like, I feel sometimes I don't even recognize half the Mm -hmm. time, especially when I'm just sitting here talking to them. Yeah. But because it just feels so normal. But oh, yeah. Like your, your value that you're for yourself from this is like way better at talking with people. You're meeting oh, people. Oh, way better at that. Yeah. yeah. Like you're you're building up yourself and you're doing challenging things that are resulting in like basically yeah. benefits that, that you're not going to see. You could ask like anyone in my family. They would have told you never in a million fucking years would I have guessed that he would be doing something like this. Because I've always been extremely introverted. I don't like if I'm in a group setting of people, I'm the one that's in the corner kind of like just observing everyone Mm -hmm. and listening and watching and stuff so being able to get out of my comfort zone has been a struggle for one but it's something that i've personally needed a lot just for my own gain yeah absolutely it's it's gonna open doors for you forever basically and you're opening doors for other people too like people that come on your show. yeah that's what i want people that come on your show now have uh, a stage to present whatever they want and the people viewing your channel like you have pretty pretty regular views it's going to be great for them and then you know that person could work for this company and help you with this or work for that company and help you with that or just in general become a good friend so like all of these things that you're doing you're not expecting it it's not something that you want from them but it's like yeah we're all here we're all struggling we're all doing stuff so it's like if you have of it (laughs) like if you know a, a contractor and you know a plumber and you know a guy who does concrete you can basically build a house way cheaper than if you didn't know them. And all you got to do is know them. All, I just need everything else. I can frame it. Yeah, it's not I who can do you, that myself and everything. Yeah, it's not what it you know. It's who you know. And yeah. that you can skate through life uh, pretty happily if you know the right people. Yeah. That's not only the podcast, but with my own media company and stuff, I have learned that very quick. Mm-hmm. Uh, and like you said, have, being able to give up some of those responsibilities and stuff, that's been a hard thing for me to yeah. do because I naturally just want to have control of everything Mm -hmm. uh but i've learned because i now have an editor myself i have an audio editor assistant stuff like that so it's now that i've learned it it's taken tremendous amounts of burdens off of me but you also add more to it as well Mm -hmm. so it's a balance yeah it is uh as you grow you know you you have to shed that shed that but then you're also going to take on more that's just that's just growth drifting is so new that from a suspension perspective um everything that drifting is is related to something else that's been done before and yeah i've told people before one of the easiest things that you could do to understand the kinematics of a drift car is to look at basic bike bicycle setups and that's not you're not drifting a bicycle but you can see the caster angle and the offset of the front fork and how oh, okay yeah and how that relates to the ability to drive your bike with no hands mm-hmm. um without caster you wouldn't be able to do that so you can relate that there and then in the rear um uh, with a pedal bike any squat is like major majorly yeah. calculated based on the the biker's size like they have to mm-hmm. change the the arm and do a bunch of calculations to determine that so you can look at yeah. diagrams of a bicycle and you can figure out a lot of things because it's like it's almost like a a 2D example mm-hmm. of everything that we deal with on a drift car. Um and then if you t- It literally is. Yeah. It's I used like, to, I, it's it's 2D to make, like so. if you want to if you want to understand something you got to go to the basics and like a bicycle is basically a 2D version of a car so go to the bike. Mm. And then you can go to dirt track. Dirt track's been drifting for 70 years um and they've been applying what we have been applying Recently. That was like my first motorsport I ever got to see in person. Dirt yeah, track so over. I mean, there's there's lots of ways that you could relate anything to drifting. Monster yeah. trucks have any squat too. They've got all those suspension angles built in. Yeah. Um, not nearly to the level. Like they are obviously much simpler and they have rear wheel steering. So like it's not the same at all, but <laughs> yeah. it's all there. It's all yeah. the same thing. The, the mechanical design of how a, a vehicle can move with four wheels is basically the same on everything. All right, well, do you have anything major coming up for FDF? Any parts that you haven't disclosed yet that you can now or should be out in a couple weeks? Good question. We've got a collaboration with a really big driver that we're releasing a kit for probably in two to three weeks. Okay. Um, Probably the biggest driver 
in drifting so i'm not going to say who it is but oh can, shit so that's a collaboration that we're going to be working together on that it's going to be awesome congrats um, yeah we we had some facetimes some video calls on the design i basically did the whole design yeah. um made it exactly how our conversations have gone and then uh applied it to the to the simulation we simulated the kit with his car with a scan of his 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 exact car mm. and he loved everything that that it that had been done basically just put his stamp of approval on it we're shipping him the kit he's going to throw it on test it out and then we're going to be announcing that collaboration so that's cool um that'll be february and then march the big things are going to start happening like with the build with what i'm doing with uh with the channels and the pages and yeah. we're buying more cnc machines we're always buying cnc machines that's just just never ending we need a bigger shop so we're going to be growing in that aspect somehow um yeah i don't know how that's going to go yet either we expand more into the building that we're currently in or we do something crazy so yeah. it's that's that's ever ever changing and developing and you know from from that uh i wouldn't say there's a whole lot else going on that covers a lot that, yeah that, oh definitely it's quick to say but that's going to take all year to do yeah. those things. <laughs> yeah definitely um do you have is there any part of the schedule for driving this year that you can speak on I know. Yeah, like we're now, we're taking this car with the drivetrain that I'm talking about. Um, is we're taking that to SEMA and PRI. I'm gonna have okay. a booth at PRI, an actual FDF race. Oh booth. no way! We're, yeah, we're gonna bring as many employees as possible, and that's gonna be a blast. PRI has always been that's awesome. fantastic. Um, we'll be probably doing some some grid lifes as usual. Um, Hyperfest is in the air, and we'll be doing some competitions like the the English Town events are always awesome mm. and chris is great uh those aren't too far from you no six and a half hours so okay yeah. and i have a i have like a, a little spot there at the track that's kind of like the fdf spot where we have like kits and tires and wheels and he kind of gives us free reign to that spot cool, so yeah it's like a second home in in the u.s as of right now um events we'll probably do some dmcc stuff in canada i i think you've probably seen some content from yeah. my pages from that but it's a serious competition that uh, i would recommend a lot of u.s drivers come to because i don't know what it is maybe the cold just makes us a little more resilient to stuff but man these guys don't care about anything and like <laughs> there's there's a sense of urgency because we only get a shorter amount of time to drive yep. So like it's full sand all the time. Like the crashes at DMC. I say it all the time. We're spoiled here. Like just in my location, I have at least six, seven, maybe eight tracks that I could drive to within a three hour distance. Mm -hmm. So like we're spoiled as shit. Yeah. And it's kind of like the kid that had everything that you were friends with and he, he, you're like, how do you have a dirt bike and you don't ride it every day? How do you have a pool and you're not swimming? Yes, out? dude. Yes. You have a trampoline and you don't even jump on it. Like I go to those friends' houses and I'm like, this is paradise. There's so much shit to do. And they're Let's not go. they're not using any of it. So yeah. then in retrospect, you look at like uh in Canada, we just have this short little window with a few little tracks and we just go hard, like hardcore yeah. on we and you know what? An off season to build your car is not a bad thing. Like you you kind of need that break to apply yes. what you've learned, fix what was broken. So, especially getting to the level that you are. Yeah. Stuff like that. Yeah. So those events are awesome. And if and if UF guys came up, they would have a, a great time for one like yeah. when when a driver wins they got like lasers circling them everyone's going crazy it's all french and i don't know what anyone's saying which is cool <laughs> like you That's you awesome. only know that you won because you're being circled by a bunch of green lasers <laughs> like you're, like and they're screaming what? and you might hear your name pronounced completely wrong but you just kind of like just go with it yeah. exactly and then if you lose you have to like do burnouts and roast your tires off like they want the show oh wow it's not, it's not like this uh prim and perfect you got to drive off and keep it cool it's like yeah. no they want you to just party so they're pulling like aspects of drift masters and stuff yeah. like that the oh yeah dmcc's and the way that like they're so uh good at at judging in dmcc yeah. um you'll never disagree with a the call there like that's how good it is that's good and it's also a spec tire. So you have to run a 265 Zestino and everyone has to run that. Okay. And the Zestino Gredge is a good tire. Like you can you can go fast with that tire. Um, I had the fastest entry at the last track, 172 kilometers an hour, which is like 105 miles an hour, something like that. Nuts. But uh, it was crazy. And people were hitting the wall at that speed. 
Jay, the drifter crashed there um, the first time in his new car. He said the car was insane. It was amazing. It has all of our products on it. And it was like, basically, he pushed the limit because he's a great driver. And you always need to find the limit of, of your chassis, yeah, but it doesn't help if there's a wall. <laughs> Usually you would just yeah. go off the track. Choose a better track to find the limit, maybe. But <laughs> but the entry, they they should have made the run up much shorter. But they love the speed, and the crowd loves the speed. So yeah. you were basically handbraking for like a couple hundred feet, God, just because you're going way too fast. But the crowd loved it. Like it was a full blown <laughs> quarter mile drag to the initiation. Oh my point. god, dude, and that's like, insane. When you got cars like mine, like you're going fast. <laughs> like <it's, laughs> if some of the cars like they have two classes, 235 and a 265, the 235 guys were doing like 142, 144 kilometers an hour. So it's still fast, but at least you're within range of like it's not going to kill you, but <laughs> Yeah, it's still. <laughs> we're coming in. Scare the shit everyone out of like you. me and Tommy Lemare, we qualified first and second and then we podiumed that event. So like he's another driver who's like if you're going to give me the track, I'm going to use all of it. Yeah. yeah. So we're flooring it. He's flooring it, I'm flooring it. We're wondering who's going to let up first and we're like, okay, we're both going way too fast. <laughs> and then we realized like I think up. he he understeered and went off behind me in one clip that's like I'll send you that one too. It's just wild. Like, and I had to do like a reverse entry to scrub speed and we both like messed up the run. But then we oh, came man. off and we were, he's like, I almost died. And I'm like, I almost died too. <laughs> we all did. I don't know. Yeah. Congrats. High five. Yeah. Yeah. This, this one might be a little deep, I guess, but where do you see yourself after drifting is over for you? Whether it's you can't drift anymore physically or, you know, you just too old yeah i mean i have two kids they're seven and nine so it's definitely gonna have to do with with them mm -hmm. and their role in either the company or whatever i um set up for them to, to do mm -hmm. if that's drifting if that's taking over one of my cars and, and becoming a young driver or something like that um we definitely have the right foundation to do that yeah for the, for these kids yeah. And uh, they're really they're really good at everything that they do, and they're super smart. So it'll it's they're just very gonna, energetic. Yeah, I it's, love seeing them at the at yeah. Events. It's gonna have to do with them. Um, I'll probably end up managing a team or helping run a team or just being involved, you know, for a long time. Yeah, it's gonna be really crazy to see old guys in drifting because of how young it is. All of us in it right now are going to be the old guys. Um, yeah, there's gonna be a couple because drifting's been around here for. 20 years but relevant for like 10 so the guys that came into drifting like 10 years ago uh plus like your chris forsberg your matt field they're gonna be like old yeah in, in real the sport i'm sure they're the gonna stick around in it but yeah i'm just gonna have to um you know direct the company in the direction that it should go mm -hmm. and get my kids involved in motorsports because yeah it really is so so busy and it requires so much discipline and so much uh, attention to detail it's going to make you just a solid person yeah like it just does definitely that's why the character in drifting is so good usually there's obviously outliers but yeah for the most part everyone is like very supportive and very uh disciplined because you got to be to get there yeah some people show up with like you know pretty janky setups but for the most part at a certain level everyone's on the same page and you know that's what i want my kids to be a part of whether it's drifting or a different type of motorsport, they definitely are going to be involved somehow, and I'll be busy. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Um, I've, I just thought about that the other day, and I was like, I've that's never really even crossed my mind what I would do once all of this is over, because it's got to come to a stopping point at some yeah, I mean, time. Like, yeah, what are you going to be doing? It's basically like you think of influencers in in YouTube. What are they going to be doing? Well, what they are doing is yeah. they're reinvesting in tangible assets while mm -hmm. using the umbrella of of youtube to support it so if you look at like adam lz for example he's going to have so many assets so much real estate so many things he can he can stop whenever mm -hmm. and he's got enough cash uh, out and he's good residual for his life residual income and and you build a name for yourself a name is worth like it's priceless basically mm -hmm. if you build a name and a reputation for yourself so like even though content that he's creating may not be sustainable, he can pivot or he can do whatever because he's established himself in multiple different cri different criteria. And I would recommend to anyone that's in this market, use it to to grow yourself as an individual and then allow yourself to be able to pivot 
uh, in any direction. Like keeping yourself constrained to to one thing is not going to be good, but it's how you have to start. So yeah, yeah, like and I've that I've tried to not do that starting this up. That's why the media company is my mm -hmm. my main thing. That's my main gig, my day job, whatever. Yeah, uh, but I use this to promote that too yeah, sometimes exactly. and i don't i try not to be overbearing on that sense because like i, I just don't like shoving that shit down people's throat but mm -hmm. um yeah the whole idea that i have learned to approach it with is you're just using the reach that you gain to build something outside of youtube whether people know it directly correlates to your name or not mm -hmm. that's what the whole goal of doing youtube is yeah from yeah. a very bare perspective. I mean, a lot of them are building their assets with cars, like they're buying and building cars. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. those cars have sustained value, so they're going to be able to sell them at some point. Yeah, it's, my, so, it's my savings right. my retirement fund. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Oh, yeah. All right, well, yeah, I, I just thought that was an interesting question, and I had never asked anyone that, so. Yeah, sweet. You seemed like the perfect one, too. Um, all right, well, let's do the sub-questions really quick. So, Miles T. Johnson... Uh, what's the hardest part of the manufacturing process and how does FDF streamline it? Hardest part of manufacturing would be probably the labor and, and human beings. <laughs> um, <laughs> I believe that one. Yeah. Yeah. Quality control is easily, uh, managed if you do everything yourself. If you have to outsource stuff, that's where you run into issues. So doing as much as you can within under one roof is the best way to sustain scale and grow but it will cost you much more so there is a trade-off yeah. if you outsource everything your margins will be much better you'll make more money but then stuff's going to bite in you the in the ass term. stuff's going to bite you in the ass and you're not building an asset um you're not building any assets for yourself mm -hmm. and yes the margins will be there but you're not investing in anything it's uh so i like to invest in people first and then mm -hmm. i like to invest in assets second and yeah so anything that we do outsource is always done locally and if we buy another machine it'll reduce the outsourcing by another 20 percent. so we're just our goal is to just reduce mm -hmm. that to zero so that we do everything gotcha um yeah like we had issues with powder coating so we bought a powder coating setup <laughs> we had issues with uh machining and tolerances so we buy our own machines and yeah we determine the tolerances and so on and so forth so it takes a while to build but um, you just got to be patient. And so, Ethan Giordano, um, I hope I said that right. Uh, what does FDF actually stand for? Uh, yeah. So the first letter is my last name, Fillets, yep. Design and Fabrication. Oh. So when I started it, I was designing and fabricating for people as a as a service. Mm -hmm. um, when I started FDF, which was roll cages and design work, I wasn't really selling any products when I came up with this name. Yeah. So right now it's just an acronym that everyone knows, but that's what it stands for. That's hilarious that we were just talking about that mm -hmm. in accordance to mine. Yeah. All right. So three shot underscore NOS when designing an angle kit for an originally front wheel drive car, what are important considerations to make? Yeah. So front wheel drive car has different uh, kinematics for pretty much everything. Uh, the way that they position the control arms is going to factor like any squat and stuff because that's the driven wheel. So what you're really going to want to consider is uh, like you could probably ignore those aspects and just focus on good wheel clearance, um, making sure that you got a knuckle that supports a wheel bearing that doesn't need an axle mm. so that your axle doesn't or your wheel bearing doesn't fall apart. Because I do Subaru kits, which is all wheel drive, but basically the same yeah. problems. Um, hopefully it's a McPherson strut so that that keeps it simple. If it's a double wishbone, you're going to just add complicated aspects to, to an angle kit. Um, you don't need to consider a ton. Like there's anti-dive and there's anti-squat and both of those are going to be applied on a front wheel drive car. Whereas on a rear wheel drive car, you're only going to have anti-dive to consider on the control arm angles. Anti-dive is what prevents the front of the car from compressing under braking. Gotcha. So... That's basically it. You want to make sure that it's not a weird steering rack. So front wheel drive cars have their steering racks in really weird positions and it can really throw off your, you know, your ability to get good angle with, yeah, with a yeah. good Ackerman curve. An Ackerman curve is kind of dictated by where the steering rack is placed. Mm -hmm. So yeah, consider those and you'll be, you'll be good. I don't know if you're making it or not, but <laughs> consider those. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. uh, all right. So next one, Koki. Casey, uh, Kooky when 
Kooky, whatever, however you say it. Yeah. Uh, when are more Driven by Josiah episodes coming? Yeah, so we just got super busy there at the end of the year. Um, we're going to have on a couple new people starting, let's say February. We're going to have okay. somebody on. They're typically like one to two hour episodes. And the last one I recorded was actually in December. And the disc, I got a disc error on the yeah you're, on the recording device, and basically an hour and fifty minutes. Like it was like a two and a half hour podcast with a with a friend of mine who's a who's a, like a, a an entrepreneur. His dad's an entrepreneur, and he was super cool to talk to. Mm. Basically, all of it was gone, so that was really disappointing. <laughs> hey, when that happens, and then I got not like you know I I didn't get discouraged or anything, but we're gonna be having another guy on Liam Stanford. He owns a Slip Club. I don't know if you've heard of that. It's like a apparel company. That oh, it's yes, pretty cool. Yes, yeah. He's got some cool stuff going on. So I'll have him on next, and that'll probably be in February. And he drifts an E46, and yeah. he drives quite a bit. So yeah, it'll be in February. And my goal was every uh, every four weeks. I was trying to post yeah. less often than you, but I'm I'm doing a bunch of other things. So yeah, I'm gonna try and get better back on priorities that. to focus on. I've seen the statistics. It's like uh, 95% of podcasts fail before 25 episodes. Yeah. And then of the ones that make it to 25, an additional 70 fail after. So, I'll tell you why. Because YouTube doesn't even know you who you are until after your th- roughly 30th episode. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, spot- the, you the Spotify the downloads are what I had the most of. I was yeah. shocked at how many Spotify downloads I had. I get more consistent viewers and watchers on Spotify than any other platform. Yeah. And what do you use to post of your Podbean or something? Uh, I use Spotify's RSS feed. Oh. The anchor. Okay. That way, because that's the only way you can post video podcasts on to Spotify. Spotify specifically. And you post video podcasts because mine are just audio. Yeah. I post the video, the same video okay. file. That's cool. On Spotify. Yeah. yeah sweet. Yeah. And it'll yeah, give soon. you the analytic, and you can actually, you'll be able to monetize that through Spotify. There's better monetization stuff. Like, I, it's obviously not a lot because you don't hardly get paid shit by monetization, but um, I make about roughly the same as I do YouTube on hmm. Spotify just by That's running simple Yeah, ads. I have way more views and downloads on Spotify, but I'm not getting anything. I use Podbean, which is what uh, I think Jacob uses with FD. Um, to manage yeah. everything because it'll post and do it all for you like to every yeah yeah it'll post to all of them for you that's what i was doing um shit i don't remember the name of the i think it was buzzsprout something or something like that, like that. <laughs> i don't know weird it names was, but... <laughs> think media that's who i was watching at the time whenever i okay. was like really learning and researching youtube stuff right on uh but yeah uh i don't know how we derailed from that so much uh stefan p white uh, if LS wasn't an option, what engine would you use? I don't want to be boring and say the 2JZ, but uh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it would probably be the next two, step. Yeah, it'd probably be a 2J. Um, Facilities had really good luck with the VR, so maybe consider that. And then an RB, only if it's tuned by my boy Lee Bird. Um, see, he just seems to make them work like no one ever yeah. has been able to before. And then Sean Booth absolutely rips on his <laughs> RB25. God, yeah. So. I mean, they're made, I think they're putting down like five, 600 wheel and they just scream. Like you could go easier on the engine, but they still seem to last. So yeah. RBs, my first car was a RB25 swapped S13, which nice. I did the swap on. I bought half of a Skyline for two grand, which is when they were cheap, like 10 years ago. And then I did, yeah. uh, I sold everything to a guy who crashed the Skyline. So I made all my money back. I kept the engine because he just needed airbags and steering wheel and stuff. That's hilarious. And then that was my first car, daily driven S13 that I bought out of a barn, did all the rust repair work on it, put an RB25 in it. (laughs) And like, I just kept flipping stuff and selling stuff. And I sold like, it had coilovers on the front. So I sold those for like 250 bucks and like the half cut. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's an RB25 has been, you know, good to me. Sounds the coolest, I think. So yeah, I mean, I mean, I'd consider RB like, only you know, a flea. Only the one a flea. that I have is came out of Wes's car, and like, dude, it's been beat to shit, and it just yeah. takes every bit of it. I don't understand the the negativity towards RBs. Yeah, it'd be an inline six before it was another V8, but the NASCAR V8s and the and the stuff like that, those are cool yeah. as well. But I wouldn't want to have the liability of fixing them if something went wrong. That's fair. Hell yeah. All right. Well, uh, B Rad A Z. Uh, he has that that three two six power FC. Oh yeah. 
Um, yeah, so he, when are you making stuff for the rear of an SFC? Uh, I mean, I do have a good friend that we just did the new front kit on, and uh, um, I'm probably going to be doing his car in the rear soon. It's going to be, I'm not going to put soon as in like a couple months, it's probably going to be sometime this year that he's going to be driving our new front kit a lot, and he'll probably bring the car back in and we'll do some more 3D scanning. I know a lot of people have asked. The problem is it's an old chassis that uh has fewer you know people driving them yeah. so it's not to say that i don't want to or i think it's like not a not a chassis that it's worth investing in it's just they're not making any more mm -hmm. and you know the ones that are out there have already been set up and, and modified yeah so basically what you'd be doing is taking parts that you had from another company off and putting mine on and what's the justification for that when it's it's it might be marginally better or something, but it's not yeah. going to be like be a this is a game changer. It's going to or... fix everything. It's like the stuff that's been done has already been done, and it's been done for like ten years. So. There's no wow factor to market it. And like well, there's no there money anymore. to really be made on the time invested on gotcha, the rear gotcha. stuff. And okay. yes, I would like to, and and I know the guy that we did the, the products on wants it, but mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of where we're at. Maybe six months to a year, I would say. Well, if you want to take that FC sitting outside, right? Uh, yeah. Do whatever you want to. I flat don't care. Tires, yeah. <laughs> I think it's got two flat tires, actually. Nice. nice. Um, yeah, that'll be a future build. Uh, so I guess in your sense, we'll run with the C6 Corvette. Um, you basically, you have a bone stock version of a C6, and you have tires, um, and then you have three thousand dollars to spend on that car at. I use Njuku because presenting sponsor. Mm -hmm. um, and what parts are you going to prioritize with that $3,000 to get to your very first track day ever? Uh, the nice thing about the Corvette is you don't need a welded diff for the Corvette. Um, so the first things that I would do is making sure that you're comfortable in the car seating wise. So you'd probably get a seat, seat brackets, a steering wheel, um, and then you just need a mini kit on the front to... Yeah. Get yourself Especially more. Corvette. The Corvette's horrible, um, and then probably a rad, and then that might bring you right up around three three thousand. You'll probably be a bit shy, so maybe consider something to do with uh, proportioning the brakes properly. But other than that, that's what you're going to want to run with. I'm going to recommend not getting a handbrake because um, a handbrake. Yeah. I consider a handbrake to be an insurance safety stick that yes. is a great tool but a terrible crutch. Yeah. So if that was a fast way to describe what a handbrake is, um, it's going to save you when you need to be saved, but it's going to hinder you if you learn with it. Yeah. So yeah. understanding. That's something I wish I didn't put in when I first went out. Yeah. The best thing to do is if you ever get into ice drifting, spend like hours driving with no handbrake, not just a couple laps, hours driving yeah. with no handbrake. And you'll really understand how drifting a corner without one Mm -hmm. depends a lot more on your front end than it does without gotcha. or, sorry it does it depends a lot more yeah. on your front end and what you're doing with your wheels than it does uh with a handbrake so with a handbrake you can just drive in and pull it and it's like guaranteed gonna drift yeah, yeah. but uh, without your momentum drifting and to momentum drift you need far more control and you need to place the car in the right spot or else you're gonna be way off and your speed needs to be perfect yeah, um, not over rotating. Typically speaking, that. in FD, especially at Irwindale, if you're entering with no handbrake, you have a major advantage over people. But most people use their handbrake because it's a safety stick. It's going to ensure yeah. that you're going to drift, and it's going to reduce too much speed, especially in the chase. And you'll find a massive gap is built between the lead and the chase as soon as they initiate, because one is flicking into the bank full throttle, the other is maybe entering with a little more speed, but then you pull that handbrake, you drop. 15 miles yeah. an hour immediately and he's not catching up after that and then you think Especially of the drive line track. you think of the drive line you're stopping uh 80 to 90 miles an hour dead and then you're yeah. starting it again um there's mm -hmm. a there's a delay there that you can't avoid so learning without one is definitely recommended so with the corvette you'd be laughing with that yeah <laughs> hell yeah all right well i guess we'll get the best piece of advice you have for just anyone getting into drifting period uh anyone getting a drifting best advice um best advice i have is spinning out is better than straightening out and when in doubt throttle out that'll save you in every scenario. wow yeah every single scenario that you put yourself in if you remember that you'll be fine 
Damn. And I can give that you an example. It was like the simplest way to ever put that. Yeah, I can give That's you an example. Perfect. Um, if you were to spin out on a track with walls, yeah. you'll be totally fine. If you were to straighten out because you lifted, for example, you'll hit the wall. And what did I say originally? When in doubt, throttle out. So if you throttle out, you'll never straighten out. And the point is, you'll always be able to, you know, save yourself from an impact if you spin out instead. And even if you spin out and you have enough momentum to hit the wall, it'll be far less damaging. If yeah. you, you'll probably hit the side or the back and that's way better. And hopefully you spin out towards the inside because when you stay on throttle, there's a really funny video of me and Connor going way too fast <laughs> in India. Indiana, I don't know if you've seen it, where we go in the last corner way too fast and I applied this theory uh, perfectly where he literally almost, he almost flips the car behind me oh, um, because shit. we, so when we go against each other, um, we're, we're the two fastest guys, we're the two full throttle guys, we're the yeah. two, we're just going all out. This is practice, by the way. Um, this is just practice. And I'm <laughs> going in the wait for the, <laughs> I'm the going call. into the last corner, full throttle, no handbrake, full commitment. And I'm like, we are going way too fast. Yeah. <laughs> so I continue to stay in the throttle, point the car to the inside because I'm being courteous to, to Connor behind me. Connor is also going way too fast. He just flies off. Like he just simply, my smoke line blinded him oh, and he yeah. flies off. I see his car go pretty much completely sideways. <laughs> I got to find this video. It's hilarious. But then yeah. I keep it floored. <laughs> I go towards the inside, over rotate and keep driving. Cause I know that there's, if I go off the end of that corner, there is a bear, like a a steel beam anyways and like a concrete block Ooh. and i'm like i don't want to go that yeah. way but then a fence Wrong is in front route. of me so i hit a fence and it is like the textbook sound of a fence just getting smashed <laughs> like if there was a if there was a driving scene in a movie where you blast through the gates they would it probably use this like sound because i hit the post and the post just went poof, poof, and it made i the, think of the uh when lz ran the gate at the feed the freedom factory doing the yeah. freestyle run yeah that was years ago but so you know, apply that and you'll be fine. It'll save you every single scenario. Hell yeah. Well, yeah, you put that the simplest and best way. So awesome. Uh, well, I started this question a few episodes ago. What is your one message to just the entire world and just anyone? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I guess the best thing that I could say to drifters and non-drifters alike is, uh, don't be afraid to make mistakes. Mistakes are the cheapest way to getting the best lesson. If you wanted to take a lesson that a mistake would teach you at university or college, it would probably cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars. So don't be afraid to do that. It will teach you things that you'll remember forever. And, you know, that's how we've all gotten here. If you look at anyone that you admire, they've probably made a lot of mistakes. So that's all I have to say. Thanks for having me on the podcast. I don't know if this is the outro or not. Yeah, yeah. So, we're, yeah, but, we're basically at it. Okay, cool. So. Yeah, well, I appreciate you coming on. Came a long way, and this one's been long overdue. So yeah, it's been yeah, awesome. And right. let me know if you guys do want to have another one of these in the future. Maybe I finally make the trip out to FDF myself. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, we I could ask do. you the questions on mine. That would yeah. be interesting. Yeah, there we go. Sweet. Um, all right. Well, yeah, that's all we got for this one. So I guess just look below the video. Make sure that subscribe button is not still red, and hit the bell so you're always updated. Grab the merch as always, and. Appreciate you listening. We have a new episode every single Sunday. Staying way up, up, up to the ceiling. Trust no bitch, can't catch no feelings. I've been taking long flights from the bay to Ibiza. Hit home runs, I'm a ball like Jeter. I just want fuck, 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 then I leave. I'm a young pop star, caught a